at this point. And at some point, I think this this secular bull market here in, in the stock market is going to be over. And the, the liquidity, as we discussed previously, has already started to, uh, some of it has started to flow into the commodity sector. I think a lot more of it will start to flow into the commodity sector. And we will continue uh, what I think was the beginning of a secular bull market in commodities that started in 2020. I think will continue as the stock market starts a secular bear market. So I do have um, a question on this chart. Uh, going, it goes back to, from my vantage point, 2004. And looking at from about 2004 to halfway through 2012, uh, the angle of the 200-week moving average is relatively flat. It started up into the great financial crisis and then came down some. But the angle from mid-2012 up through current is on a substantially different trajectory. What what does that speak to you, and is that normal? So, this period from the top in two thousand until we you know finally broke out. Um, you know, what was this twenty thirteen? I think this is a secular bear market, and this was when gold and commodities had their their bull market into that um, two thousand and eight top when oil went to one hundred forty seven dollars. Gold had its first test of uh, nineteen hundred dollars. Uh, this was a secular bear market in stock. So, you know, you can see here the S&P was not able to make higher highs. And then we have the, the great uh, recession. And then we start a new secular bull market. So the um, liquidity uh, was uh, going mostly into stocks at this point. And at some point, I think this this secular bull market here in, in the stock market is going to be over. And the liquidity, as we discussed previously, has already started to, uh, some of it has started to flow into the commodity sector. I think a lot more of it will start to flow into the commodity sector. And we will continue uh, what I think was the beginning of a secular bull market in commodities that started in 2020. I think we'll continue as the stock market starts a secular bear market. So in another post, um, you stated, I'm just not seeing this recession that everyone is predicting. Recessions don't just magically appear. There has to be a catalyst to collapse middle-class spending before a recession starts. Historically, the trigger for, econ for economies to roll over into a recession has been a surge in inflation, not an increase in interest rates. By that, I mean the price of oil spikes 100% or more in a year or less. This is too much of a shock for the lower and middle class. They have no discretionary income. They need everything to just fill up the gas tank and put food on the table. And every recession since 1970 has been preceded by a surge in the price of oil, other than the self-inflicted recession of the COVID shutdown. Gary, can the markets drop significantly into a secular bear market and rotate into other assets without a recession occurring? And is that what you're expecting this time around? How do you see this playing out? So I'm going to take a guess here and say uh, we're going to get our four-year cycle low uh, for two reasons, that uh, that debt rollover and all the liquidity that the Fed has pumped in is just going to, is going to push price too far above this um, long-term mean, the 200-week moving average. And, and the reason this happens is you get this, this is a runaway move, this this vertical move that we're getting here. And what happens is you get more and more people that are chasing on the way up here. As, as price doesn't correct, it doesn't give them an entry. And so finally they they just give up and they they can't, you know, can't can't stand the pain of missing any more of the of the rally. And so you're you're getting lots and lots of buyers into this um, vertical move. And then when the profit taking does start you've just got um you know a, a, a house of cards of of stops all set up all along this vertical move to get tripped as the um profit taking event starts you, you start tripping some stops here and that causes the market to fall a little more and then you got some more here and here and that that's why these vertical moves collapse is because you get uh, people that have chased this thing all the way up so you just got stops 
uh, all the way up along this vertical move and that creates the crash and so you know the the further this gets stretched above uh, the, the more violent the crash of the regression event tends to be and so like i said almost all four-year lo cycle lows will at least test the 200-week moving average depending on how far this runaway move goes how far it stretches above the mean i suspect the crash when it when it does happen is going to go considerably below this again like i said i think maybe the um, 2022 low might get broken I think, especially in an election year, I think the Fed will panic. I think they'll print a bunch uh, of liquidity trying to prop this back up. And, you know, the same same thing happened here uh, as the housing market was collapsing. The Fed was printing, trying to um, prop up the housing market and the stock market. It didn't it didn't rescue either one of those, but it did power that um, final um, move to in, in the commodity markets and that final move to. $147. That was the inflationary surge that collapsed the economy. Um, and I, I tend to think the recession was, you know, the, the housing market collapsing weakened the economy some, but it was what really destroyed it was the Fed printing all that money, um, trying to rescue the stock market and the housing market. And it created an inflationary uh, or a massive inflation. And that's what destroyed the economy at the um, uh, the middle class and the lower class couldn't handle the inflation. They quit spending and businesses, you know, stop, stop making money. They have to start laying off people, vicious circle down you go. So I suspect what's going to happen here is, is the initial uh, problem is going to be that they've allowed the market to, to go parabolic. We'll get a crash at some point that they will start to print again. That will start to power um, the second leg of the commodity bull market. And, um, We'll, we'll get, you know, a, a huge move up in the in the commodity market. And when it goes up too far, too fast, that'll be our next recession. Interesting. So that'll be the um, the fuel for the for gold, the miners, silver to all begin taking off. Yeah. And it'll be the um, it'll be the driver for the recession. I don't really think we have a driver uh, for a recession just yet. Uh, I, I don't you know, I, if I go to the restaurants and stuff or the casinos, there's still plenty of people. Uh, I still see, you know, um, signs, hiring signs out in a lot of places. So I just don't see the recession just yet. I think we need that. Um, we, we need that catalyst and it's almost always going to be inflation. Yeah. So, um, you know, with, with gold, it seems like we have a bifurcated market where central banks are buying very heavy, but Western generalist investors are net sellers. So are you, are you seeing, um, you know, the, the market's crashing because they're so extended, the market's crashing, the Fed coming in to the rescue, printing, et cetera, leading to the next inflationary move as the setup that's needed for investors to move into gold miners, or do you see them moving in even earlier than that because maybe they realize, wow, they're just so cheap? Well, I think smart money's moving in right now. Now, now is when you got the bargains, but it's pretty hard for retail type investors to, to buy that, you know, they, they want to buy this because they buy emotionally. And right now this is easy money. So when, when people buy into these kind of moves, the, the, here's what happens is you look like a genius for two, you know, for a week or two weeks or a month or two months. And then you look like a complete idiot because you get caught in the crash and you give it all back and, and then some, because you know they didn't buy down here, so they have some protection if they do get caught at the top. They're they're buying into this, they're they're buying because of the the fear of missing out, the FOMO. So they're buying too late. Uh, they're buying as the market goes up. They're they've convinced themselves. You know, no matter how many bubbles we go through, people never learn the lesson. But they convince themselves that it can never go down, and so uh, they they buy late. They look like a genius for a while. And then they get caught at the top because they can't control greed and they can't at some point say, hey, I've made enough. I'm going to sell, make sure I don't get caught in the top. And then they, they give back all of their gains. So they don't make they don't actually make any money. And then they generally they they get into the mindset that, you know, I've, I've lost all my gains. So I'm just going to hold on till I get back to where I was. 
but if you know if you're in a in a bear market you're, you're never going to get back to where you were so you you hang on and then not only have you lost all your gains now you're underwater and then at some point you're so far underwater that now you just want to get back to what you initially started with but again if you're in a bear market you don't ever get back to that point and they they keep holding and keep holding until they've lost everything and so that's why the vast majority of people never make any money off of a bubble it's interesting. So when we're on the cusp of the the next new gold bull market, are you anticipating the miners to sniff it out ahead of time and begin moving higher? Um, yes, um, silver, silver as well. Um, I think, like I said, we, we may be at a bottom here. I, I'm not sure. I think we're at least at a daily cycle low. I'm just not sure if we're going to have to have another daily cycle after this one that then comes down and breaks that, that 2000 and we get a, a you know, another lower low in the miners. Uh, maybe something that tests the 2022 lows. If we could do that, that would be the, the, the buy of the century. Don't know how much, you know, how well the odds are of that happening, but if it, if it did, man, that, that would be unbelievable buying opportunity. Um, I'm again, I'm watching a few things. And I'll keep my subscribers informed whether or not I think we've formed the bottom here or whether I think we've got one more uh, rally that is pretty convincing, but then rolls over and then we have to break below that 2000 before we, we get our final bottom. But uh, I'm tracking that on a daily basis. We'll, we'll see. And I'll, I'll make a call with which one I think it's going to be here pretty soon. Maybe this week we'll know which way it's going to go. So you mentioned in a post last week that the odds probably aren't great, but if, if this is to your point that you just mentioned that if GDX could enter a bloodbath phase and crash down to the 22, 23 zone, it would create the potential for a massive regression event back to and far above the 200 uh, daily moving average gains of 75 to a hundred percent in a matter of several months become possible far beyond anything Bitcoin tech or uranium are capable of at this point. Yet these are the sectors people are chasing while they completely ignore the massive potential that is building in the metal sector. Would you walk us through what your analysis is pointing to if it gets down to that level? And even if it doesn't get down to that level. Um, so uh, it, it kind of goes back to what we were just discussing. Uh, people want to chase something that's moving because they, they look smart uh, initially. Um, if, it's, if it's in a strong trending move, they get in and they, they start making money. Um, and, and when there's easy money somewhere else, they don't, they don't want to buy something that's, that's going down, but that's where the real potential is. Uh, the, the mining stocks, let's see if I can find that bottom here. Here it is. Um, so GDX, uh, what was this about oh, 12, $12. So it went up what 160, 170% in what, like six months? So it, nobody wanted to buy this down here. But, you know, they wanted to chase the stock market. But did you have 170% potential in six months in the stock market? No, you did not. So, you know, th this is, you want to buy these secular bear market bottoms. This is where the big money, the big money occurs in two periods. It occurs coming out of the bottom and it occurs uh, in the last, uh, you know, the the bubble phase, the um, the parabolic phase at the end. So that's where the 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 big quick money occurs is at the, the uh, come, you know, starting the the bear, uh, bull market and finishing a bull market. So this was your buying opportunity. Nobody wanted to buy. It had been going down for forever, and I, um, you know, I, I was trying to pick pick bottoms in here, and uh, and people were. You know, they, they they get discouraged because you, maybe you didn't get the bottom, but you have to keep trying because the the big money occurs at the bottom. So you want to you want to keep trying till you get the bottom because then you get rewarded by this. And the the same thing is going to happen here. We're we're going to get this was our eight year cycle low. So I don't I don't know if we're going to test this, but if we could, uh, you know, if, if we have one more cycle and gold has to break below 2000, we very well could test this on GDX. And, and again, I think that's the buying opportunity definitely of the, 
of the year, probably of the last five years, maybe of the of the dec of the decade of the last ten years, if we can do it. I don't know how well the odds are of, of us doing it, but but if it is, I think at that point, I think you have the potential of two hundred percent in the in the first year coming out of that bottom. So you, you got to try and buy. As Warren Buffett says, you want to buy when there or buy when everybody else is fearful, buy when there's blood in the streets. There is starting to be blood in the streets in the mining sector. Yeah, clearly. Um, so you've repeatedly shared that you prefer ETFs over individual equities when investing in precious metals and even in oil. Garrett, can you share your reasoning behind this and your history of success with your with that model versus individual equities? So um, I just don't like company specific risk. Um, you can, you know, do, well, first off, you can do all the due diligence and research you want, and maybe you've got found the best company, but maybe the market just doesn't agree with you. And, and it just doesn't reward that company, or there's something that you are missing that the market is seeing. And it just, you know, you just, you know, in theory, you have a good company, but it just doesn't pan out. The market doesn't agree with you and it doesn't reward you. Uh, for that, or, you know, something come along, maybe, uh, you know, the, the CFO defrauds the company out of a bunch of money, uh, maybe a mine gets flooded or a worker strike, you know, whatever. Um, you just don't have that with ETFs. So, uh, you know, if Newmont has some kind of problem, but the rest of the sector is going up, Newmont is not going to drag the ETF all the way back down. And you can somewhat offset company specific risk by buying a, a bucket of miners you know maybe you own 10 or 20 of them but that's basically what the etf does anyway so you know in, instead of having to monitor 10 or 20 positions you can monitor one you can get out easy if you need to you can get in easy if you need to so overall i suspect the vast majority of people are probably not going to do any better than the etf over the long haul if they've got 10 or 20 positions and they're trying to manage that by the, by the end of the bull market, I think, I, I don't think you're going to do any better than just buying GDX and making it easy for yourself. And I think, um, and, and as much as I like miners now, I don't think the miners will outperform silver between now and the end of the bull market. I think silver will, it, it will massively outperform gold. And I think it will outperform, uh, not, you know, maybe not initially, but by the time you get to the, the final top, I think silver will have outperformed the miners as well by at least a factor of two, maybe by three. Well, it's interesting that you bring up silver again at this point, because that's exactly where I wanted to take you. Um, so you've kind of done it for us. Uh, there's a recent post that you made. Silver is undoubtedly the most undervalued commodity on the planet. On top of that, no one believes it can do anything. The greatest investors in history bought when no one else wanted. The rule is when they want it bad, you should give it to them. When they can't get rid of it fast enough, you should take it. So you've repeatedly talk, talked about silver. Share with us your silver thesis. Um, you know, what is going to be the reason why this, uh, you know, why the metal is going to go up so much, why it's going to be in such high demand? What's your time frame on the price action you've talked about? What are some of the likely catalysts, et cetera? Um, so my basic thesis is basically as technical as to why I think silver is going to at least $100. Uh, again, piece of cake, $100, and probably 250 maybe even as high as 500 And it has to do with the size of the base. Again, the longer the base, the higher in space. The silver made its high back in 18 or 1980, it double topped here in uh, 2011. So we still haven't broken out. When we do break out, um, maybe in 2025, uh, that base will be 45 years long. That's got to be the longest base of anything I've ever seen. Uh, I made the prediction um, back in, must have been 2014. I said the NASDAQ is going to go back to 5,000. When it does, 10,000 is going to be a piece of cake. Again, that doesn't mean it's going to be an easy move to get there. Just I'm just saying it's going to get there. And I said, 20,000 isn't out of the question. And what happened? You know, every, at the time, 
everybody said I was crazy. You know, the Nasdaq's never going back to 5,000 and it sure as heck isn't getting to uh, 10,000. Well, the Nasdaq got, got to 5,000 and it broke out and that was a very long base. It was about a, I think it was a 16 year base. I think it was 2016 when the NASDAQ broke out above um, 5,000 and it did go to 10,000 and it got to 16,000 and it may yet get to 20,000 before this is over. So that, that was a 16 year base. We're talking about a 45 year base with silver. And that's why I say silver is the, the most undervalued commodity in the world. Don't be discouraged because it's, it's not doing anything right now. It, it is going to do something. You're getting your chance to continue to accumulate, and I'll push it again, physical silver, much easier than trying to trade. This, this is a nightmare to trade. You're probably losing money trying to trade this back and forth whipsawing market. This is a dream for people that are accumulating physical silver. You're, you're just getting more and more opportunities. You know, if you've got income coming in and you get excess income, you want to turn it into an asset that has potential to appreciate. This is a dream for those kind of people uh, that want to um, invest like a smart money investor, like Warren Buffett, like Jimmy Rogers, um, these kind of people that buy low, hang on, uh, and and then when they see massive overvaluation, massive public participation, uh, a linear move straight up, uh, then that's when they want to sell the assets. So uh, this is your opportunity to, to accumulate physical. It's, it is going to break out above that that base at 50 at some point here. And, I, and I'm confident it's going to do it during this eight-year cycle. So now's your chance. Uh, you want to be buying while it's, again, anything under $30, I think, is a gift. Is there anything um, that can stop your thesis from occurring? The end of the world, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I, I I think the the forces are already in play. We've we've uh, we ignited the inflation cycle when we uh, the, the the idiotic things the world did for COVID. I tried to warn people when that when we started doing that, locking down the world um, and that it was going to ignite the inflation cycle and it was going to ignite the worst cycle. <clears throat> They're both well underway. I, I, you know, I don't see any way that we stop it. Um, you know, no matter how many times we do this, we continue to make the same mistakes. Uh, you, you would think that, that people would get sick of wars and, and killings and, but apparently they just are politicians just do stupid things. You know, the, the uh, rule is, is that politicians never admit a mistake. They always double down. So once the war cycle starts, there's just no way to get out of it. Politicians are just going to continue to double down until enough people have been killed to where they finally have to it, uh, change course. So I don't see the inflation cycle stopping. I don't see the war cycle uh, slowing down. And as long as that continues, I, I think you're going to have a bull market in commodities. And I think you're going to have a, a huge bull market in, uh, in the metals. Yeah, um, I do want to touch on some geopolitical items, but before we do, I really want to talk about energy. Just a couple of questions. What's your current 10,000 foot macro take on oil? What do you see happening with it in 2024 and 2025 and even over the next three to five years? Uh, all right. So my piece of cake prediction for oil is, is $200. I think we're going to, again, not going to be an easy move to get there, but I think it's going to get there. Um, this was this was the bell ringing here when uh, oil went negative. It was the bell ringing that the bear market in commodities was over. First leg up. Now we're in the, the correction of this first leg. Uh, I think we've probably double bottomed here and we're getting ready to start um, the next leg. Let me see if I can. What I think is probably playing out is I think this is going to form a cup and handle pattern. Um, I think we may be starting to get a little momentum on the right side of the cup. Seems maybe. to be a very popular um, pattern these days. Yeah, we, we kind of got the same thing going on with uh, with gold, but a, a much bigger uh, pattern that, that started in uh, 2019. Um, again, the, the longer it takes for this to base um, and then break out above this, um, the 
further the move will go. We're exacerbating this with this whole Green New Deal nonsense of that for some, you know, again, when politicians make stupid decisions, they don't ever uh, reverse course. They just double down. So we've convinced ourselves that the world can somehow run without oil and we need to get rid of oil. So, you know, what incentive is there for an energy company to spend billions of dollars to try and find more oil? Not a lot. But the reality is, is the world can't run without uh, without oil, not not in its current form. Now, we can go back to uh, a lifestyle where people's lifespans are, are 30 years. We could do that without oil. But, you know, how many people want to do that? Not, not many, I don't think. So as long as as we continue in this madness of trying to destroy the sector that makes our our modern way of life possible, there's just not going to be a lot of. Um, put uh, a, not a lot of um, incentive for energy companies to try and find more oil. So I suspect a, as this continues, um, we're going to start to get some shortages in the energy sector. And that at some point, we're going to make that move to 200 and, and probably much higher. So this year in 2024, are you seeing, uh, looking at the chart, are you seeing it's, you know, fluttering in a, in a range 70 to $80? Do you see it, um, you know, breaking out of that range and starting to make that move towards that, that top there at about 120. Uh, I guess that was during the invasion of Ukraine. What are you seeing, you know, for the next 12 months? So for the next 12 months, I, I think we're starting to get some momentum on the right side of the cup. You know, we should kind of mirror the, the declining phase. We should kind of mirror it on the, on the other side. So, you know, we're in a bull market. Bull markets make higher highs. I'm pretty sure, well, I am sure, this is an intermediate cycle bottom. So here was an intermediate cycle. Here was our top. And then we had the, the corrective part of the intermediate cycle, the declining phase. I think we got our bottom. It held above this, this bottom here. Bull markets make higher highs. I expect this intermediate cycle is going to make a higher high above this. Don't know that it's going to go a long ways above it, but I think it's probably going to go above it. Might be a difficult move to get there. It could be very choppy back and forth. I think it's going to get there. Maybe maybe we get to 100. You know, a, a breakout, but not a huge breakout, not a big sustained breakout. And the rule is that breakouts that occur late in a cycle don't generally produce sustained moves. Same thing for breakdowns. Breakdowns that occur late in a cycle don't produce sustained moves. So if it takes a lot of weeks to get up here and then break out above 95, the breakout will be occurring very late in the intermediate cycle, so it probably won't produce a sustained move. And then we'll have another uh, intermediate correction. So, you know, maybe we get to 100 and then maybe we have to come all the way back down to 85. And then, you know, maybe we get to 110 on the next rally and then we have to come back down to uh, 90. Uh, so a, a choppy move, but generally moving higher as we... Um, start to get a little momentum on the right side of this uh, basing pattern. Sounds so what I see sounds here. very impactful in a negative way on the consumer who's already taking it on the chin. Well, yes and no. Um, as long as the move is, is somewhat gradual, then the consumers can adapt and, you know, they get raises and they can cope with it. It's when you get that, that big surge that happens very quickly my, my general rule is 100% in a year or less. Um, it's when you get something like that, that, so, you know, let's just say we get up here, we get to the top of the cup, we get a, a handle, maybe that comes back to 110 in the handle. And then uh, we break out and we go from 110 to 220, but we do it in a year. There's your recession. There's, there's your fundamental driver that causes the recession. Uh, but that's not going to happen this year. That might happen in 25 or 26, because I think it's going to be a while for this move to unfold. Uh, again, I don't think, I don't, I doubt that we're going to get to 130 before the end of this year. I, I think we might get to, maybe we get to 105 or 110 by the end of this year. I don't know that that's going to be a, um, a quick enough, um, a, a sudden move that shocks the economy. I think the economy could handle that kind of a move. Uh, okay. If we were to go from 70 to 140 and do it in six months, that that we cannot handle, and that would give us a recession. 
but I don't think that's going to happen. So, excuse me. So I'm assuming because you see over the next couple of years, a bull market forming here in oil that you're already moving into the oil trade. We, we got in, yeah, we got into oil right in, right in here. So we're, we're hanging on to our oil positions. We're expecting again, bull markets make higher highs. So we're kind of expecting that this intermediate cycle, while it may be difficult to hang on to and, or to trade, we're kind of expecting it's probably going to come above this peak at some point here in the next uh, couple months, maybe three months. So we're, we're trying to trade this intermediate cycle with the expectation that we'll, we're probably going to get to maybe 100. And, that, and at that point, we'll exit those long positions and wait for the next uh, correction. I see. So I want to shift over to geopolitics. You've, you've touched on it a couple of times. Last week in a uh, Twitter X post, you mentioned that you felt it's probably about time for a false flag event, similar to the Nord Stream pipeline bombing and then blaming it on Russia. Will you share your thoughts on that post and specifically your timing, Paul, with it being you know, right around now? Um, I suspect if it's going to happen, you know, the military industrial complex, they want war. And, and the, you know, the, the, most of the, um, most of the government, you know, a, a few on the conservative side are against it, but it seems like the, the, for whatever reason, the democratic side seems to be all in on war this time. And most of the conservative side seems to be all in on war. I'm sure they're all getting kickbacks from the, from the military industrial complex. Um, they, I'm sure they want to escalate the war in uh, the Ukraine. Uh, they they want to draw NATO in somehow. So in order for that to happen, you, you're going to have to attack a NATO country. Poland is the, in my opinion, it seems to be the most obvious target. Um, logically speaking, there's no way that Putin's going to attack Poland. So if they're waiting for Putin to do it, he's not going to do it. But if we do it ourselves, like, you know, I, I, it's pretty obvious the U.S. blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, so if, if we bomb something in, in Poland and then blame it on Putin and the media will, will back you up on this. And, you know, again, the rule is if you say something long enough and loud enough, you can get everybody, almost everybody to believe it, no matter how ridiculous it is. So, you know, anybody with common sense knows that Putin is, is never going to attack Poland because that brings NATO into the war. But the media will convince everybody that it, he did this and that, that'll give him an excuse to expand the war. So that's what I'm afraid is going to happen. We're going to have a false flag event that expands and escalates the war. So do you see this because of maybe just your finger on the pulse with the media or are you seeing something maybe even in your charts that are telling you that you think a move's coming and so something has to trigger a move? Um, no, it's nothing in the charts. It's just, okay. you know, this is just kind of how history plays out. And, and, you know, we've, we've obviously started the war cycle in the, you know, every, everybody in the West wants it to continue. So in order to, to escalate it, something has to happen to, to escalate and bring NATO in. This seems like the most okay. obvious one to me. Okay. Uh, before we wrap up here and Gary, I ask you the final question. I just want to remind everyone that if you're a premium subscriber to our Substack, metalsandminers.substack.com, you get a bunch of free content throughout the week, which I'm recommending you go sign up now. It's free. Just put in your email address and you'll get a whole bunch of stuff. And we cover things from the economy to metals, miners, even artificial intelligence. Um, we share all of the videos from our expert interviews, and there's some other great content that's up there. If you want to be a premium member, um, you'll get the golden nugget notes from each interview. That's our downloadable recap summary of the discussion. You get uh, some premium interview content and access to the Metals and Miners report library. There's currently 24 reports in it. So if you've enjoyed the conversation with Gary as much as I have, would you please let him know? Just hit the like button, click on the red subscribe button and the bell icon, and leave a comment below for Gary below the video. We really appreciate it. Okay, Gary, in wrapping up the discussion, I've got a two-part final question for you. What keeps you up at night that you're worried about occurring in 24, 25? And secondly, what haven't we spoken about that you want the viewers to know or consider for this year coming up? So the war cycle is, is what concerns me the most. Um, I, I'm just, like I said, 
we need to vote somebody in that's that's not going to be a, a war you know not going to be for the war there's, there's only two candidates that are that are anti-war one is trump and one is rfk um i i pray to god that one of those guys is, gets the presidency i i doubt that the swamp will allow trump to to become the president so that leaves a, a rfk as a as a possible president so that's that's my biggest worry that should be everybody's biggest worry you know if you you know if you're the age to that you could be drafted and go to war it's got to be um, your biggest worry if you've got children that could be you know conscripted into the into the war you've got to vote for one of those two people that are that are anti-war that that might have some chance of of stopping the the war machine um and then for the second part of your question i, I think we covered about everything here i don't know that there's anything i really want to add you know if you want to um, get a, a more uh, detailed and um, real-time analysis you can always subscribe to the uh, to the premium smt newsletter i do post sometimes i post videos um, free videos that you can watch on my on my blog which is blog.smtpremium.com uh, and i usually post those to twitter my twitter uh, handle is gary savage one uh, so, you know, either one of those, if you want to watch some free content, you can kind of get an, uh, an idea of how I do my analysis. It's mostly based on cycles and uh, sentiment with some technical analysis thrown in as well. Everybody, you really need to go uh, follow Gary on Twitter. He's outstanding. He shares a lot of information. Um, I always look forward to reading your post, Gary. And guys, go sign up for his newsletter Thank you so much, Gary, for spending this time with us. It's very generous of you, your time, your analysis, your ideas for coming on to Metals and Miners. It's been so good to spend this time with you. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the, inviting me on the show.